Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Evan. You are at First Covenant Church online this Sunday. Uh, weather was not cooperating with us. So this Sunday, First Covenant Church is meeting out of my basement. We're glad that you're here. Welcome. We are disciples who make disciples, and we'll use any medium to do that, whether we're simply online or whether we're together. Um, I do want to make uh, you aware of one way that we are disciples who make disciples is through small groups. This is a key part of who we are and how we stay connected with one another. Uh, they begin again our next season next Sunday, the 9th. And so if you haven't joined a group yet, I strongly encourage you to go to our website to the latest news page and you'll find a sign up form right there. Uh, and if you are in a group and you haven't heard from your leader yet, uh, make sure you connect and check on the details to make sure you're meeting at the same time and place and all those kinds of things. You'll start to see the questions uh, come out from the uh, church email next week uh, and on version as well. Those are the two sources where the questions come and uh, small groups start meeting together for the next season. Also, since we're not in person today, we're not going to be doing communion together. We do that on the first Sunday of the month. We're going to push that back two weeks. So January 16th, we'll let you, uh, remind you that week that we will do communion that Sunday uh, as our regular time of, of remembering and taking the Lord's Supper together. If you want, you can still take the Lord's Supper together at home uh, if you're alone or with family uh, and you're encouraged to do that. Uh, blessings as you do. Uh, fourth thing is that uh, we will see a video here very shortly uh, of from the Global Local Outreach uh, team from First Covenant uh, about an update on taking care of Afghan refugees. Uh, we've been waiting and collecting materials, so we're going to hear from Dick Nelson on where things stand uh, with those efforts. And then we will have a sermon shortly after that. Hello, Dick. Thank you for joining me today. We're looking forward to getting an update from GLOW, our global and outreach ministry. Um, so I'm just going to pass it off to you. What's going on with the GLOW team and what are you guys looking forward to? Well, thanks, Garrett. Uh, since we're not able to get together today, uh, I do want to give an update to the congregation on what GLOW, Glow is doing with regard to the refugee situation. I think most of you are aware that we've been trying to reach out and help some of the refugees coming into Lincoln. Uh, and, and you need to have an update because some of the situation has changed. Uh, at one point, well, first of all, let me just tell you, we are cooperating with Ceresco Covenant. Uh, and we've had a, a good response from our congregation uh, to our needs. First of all, we have nine individuals or families that have offered to actually spend time with the refugees, walk with them over the next few months as they get accustomed to living in Lincoln. Uh, Ceresco has uh, five or six families or individuals that have agreed to do that. And we've been getting donations for some items. Uh, the thing that has changed is this. Uh, we recently got an update from Lutheran Family Services, uh, who, who's serving as the coordinators for the incoming refugees. That really increases the kinds of items we need to collect to help these people establish a home. Now, uh, I just updated a flock notes that said, that there's a sign-up sheet in the parlor. Of course, that doesn't do us any good on a Sunday when we're not in church. So let me give you an idea of some of the things that we are looking for. Uh, and I guess I should say, first of all, we have been getting donations uh, and we have started storing them in the church garage. Uh, and we really appreciate everything that we've received. But uh, Lutheran family gave us a new list of, of uh, requirements for us to accommodate these families. And when you think about it, 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 it makes perfect sense. Uh, we're just not quite as prepared as we thought we were. So let me tell the, uh, you and the congregation the kinds of things that we're looking for and see what you can do to help, with, help us. Uh, let's start with some furniture, seating for the living room, chairs, small couches, 
you know, whatever. Uh, a table for eating. It could be a kitchen table or a dining room table and chairs. Now, you may have a table and you don't have chairs, so you may have chairs and you don't have a table. That's fine. We can put it all together. So if you've got one or the other or both, uh, a coffee table and, and uh, side tables for the living room, lamps, floor lamps or table lamps. Uh, here's an interesting need, and that is dressers, a place for these folks to store their clothes. Mm. And if it's not a nice dresser with drawers, maybe you've got some sort of an open cabinet that can be used for, uh, you know, storing uh, clothes, fold the clothes, put them on a shelf, that kind of things would will work. We're also looking for bedding and various kinds of linens, sheets, blankets, uh, bath towels, pillows, bath mats, things like that. And then the various things for a kitchen, like a cutting board, just cloths and towels, bakeware, a rice cooker, kitchen utensil holder, or a can opener. I mean, there, you know, there are some things here that, that hopefully would be very easy for you to do. Dish drainers. Uh, just think about the kinds of things that you need in your kitchen. That's the kinds of things that we're looking for. Uh, there are then some non-essential but nice to have kinds of things like a TV. Or do you have an old computer that is you're not using anymore? Uh, wipe it clean. Somebody would be able to use it. And it's supposed to be especially helpful for English language learners uh, to be able to work with that computer. So uh, Dick, well, here's another good one. How about children's backpacks? Okay, well, let go me ahead. Interrupt you real fast. So for when it comes to like the linens, towels, and uh, sheets and kitchenware, do are you guys looking for new items or can they be used items? They can be used items. Uh, the only new items that are required will be mattresses and box springs. Makes sense. Yeah, they, they will not take used mattresses and box springs, uh, but you know, uh, bed frames, uh, queen size or, or double size twins, they will take those things. These other, these other things certainly can be used. They do not have to be new. Uh, and once we get an identity of a family and we know how many people there are, uh, what their ages are, uh, we'll probably be asking for donations of clothing. And again, can be used clothing just as long as it's in good condition. And particularly, look outside, winter clothing. <laughs> so uh, we don't know exactly when we will be getting a family, but it should be sometime here in the near future, and we want to be ready to go. Uh, people can contact Tid, Tim Erickson if they've got something they're ready to put into the, the garage storing at church. Uh, or if you need help getting it to church, uh, get in touch with me and we will find somebody with a pickup truck and get it there. Cool. Uh, I, that's pretty much the update, Garrett. Well, that's really exciting that we're uh, doing so much to help these people that are coming into the city and probably have never lived in this kind of environment with cold weather and four seasons. Who, who knows where they're coming from? They come from all over the world. They come from all over the world. Yeah. Well, thank you for so, the update. And uh, besides giving the gifts, we can be praying specifically for this. Is there any other specific prayer requests that the GLOW team could make? Well, I, I think the prayers are really important. Uh, I can't imagine picking up my family and transferring them to a whole new culture, particularly if most of the family do not speak the language. So. Uh, it's going to take the Lord walking with them, and and uh, we need to be deeply in prayer. Uh, and thank you for bringing that up, Karen. Okay. Well, thanks again. We appreciate the update. Thank you.
This morning we're going to be speaking out of John 1.14, and I encourage you, since we're online this morning, we get a chance to interact in a different way. Um, as we go forward, feel free to interact with what's going on in the message, um, and at the end of the message today, I do have a challenge that would have led to the table, since we would have been taking that today, but I think it's still quite valuable for us to practice uh, in anticipation of the table, but you, something you should practice every day, which is confession. So John 1.14 is what we're looking at today, and uh, I encourage you to get a Bible uh, or open up your phone and follow along. One of the, the interesting questions that I've been asked over the years, um, often by students, but not always, is why did God create? Why did God create the universe? Why did God create people? Any of that sort of thing. And one of the most fascinating parts about that, and probably infuriating to some in the answer, is that we don't actually get an answer as to why God created. We certainly get an answer of the quality of God's created creation. What God created is good. We get an indication of how much God cares about his creation. I mean, the whole of Scripture is pointing at that very issue of the fact that God does care. He created and he cares. But the why is not really outlined for us or given to us. And, and one of the things, uh, it's, it's infuriating, I think, to some at first to consider that. But what I've discovered through my own experience is that people, as they get closer to Jesus Christ as his disciples, care a lot less about the why than they do about the what and the how and the when of what God is up to. They really seem more concerned the closer they get to Jesus about when is his kingdom going to come? How do they follow Jesus Christ better? The, the why is something that will be answered someday, and they don't need to know the why in order to follow Jesus better. They hunger and thirst for righteousness the closer they get to Jesus. That's my experience anyways. As we consider the why, we can consider uh, when it comes to what God created, what's the impact of our rebellion against what God created and the quality of that, which is good. Because we have been a part of the rebellion against that. Everybody that's existed has been at one time or another. We operate all too often in sinful and selfish ways, which is what breaks God's good creation that he cares about, that he loves, that he put together. I think it's uh, interesting to, to admit or, or pay attention to the fact that um, it, within the world, it's often easy for people, and even within the church, it's easy for people to not acknowledge that part of themselves, the sinful nature within themselves. But I want to give a, a sort of a cultural example of where people acknowledge that the wrong or the brokenness or things that have gone wrong, and, and maybe one way that we can bring that in and then begin to look at the word became flesh. So I'm not going to make any statement about, you know, the science or anything of climate change or any of those sort of conversations, but I do find it really interesting that within the environmental movement and the climate change movement, uh, with there is a great energy that gets put forth towards fixing a problem. You know, it's the statistics, one of the most recent surveys pointed out that four in 10 young people are afraid to have children. Four in 10 people that are emerging into adulthood are afraid to have children for the very reason that they believe that they're bringing them into a broken and fractured world environmentally. And they feel that bringing children in for whatever reason, that's going to cause problems or that's going to add to the problem or something like that. And so you have a lot of people who have taken action whether you agree with how or the, the science or how or whatever it is, that's not what I want to argue. But we have a lot of people who have taken action to say there's a problem, we're even part of the problem, and there needs to be a fix for the problem. Well, the same thing needs to be true about us and our part within God's good creation, the thing that he created. We don't know why he created it, but there's a problem, and there needs to be a fix for the problem. We have to acknowledge that we're part of the problem and need to be fixed, and that the, the brokenness that's caused there breaks relationships, both the one with God and with other people and with what God has created even more broadly. And so one of the questions that captivated people in the days of Jesus and should captivate us is, how is God's redemption worked out? How is God going to reconcile or fix the problem between us and him. 
the broken relationship that's there. And so John 1.14 is one of those answers as to how God is going to do that. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. How God's redemption is going to be worked out started through covenant, and it didn't stop when it came to Jesus. He simply fulfilled the covenant promise that God had made. A covenant is a two-way promise with teeth, basically. And God had made that promise with Abraham, and that is the story that we're reading through the Old Testament, is the fulfillment of that promise, the walking towards the eventual Messiah. The promise had been that descendants would be provided that would usher in God's kingdom. And those descendants from the line of Abraham would bless the world, and they would be a nation of priests that would call the world to God. They would demonstrate what holiness looks like and say, now come and be a part of this because this is what you were designed for. They had the law as their guide and they were demonstrating God's character and redemption through the fulfillment and maintain, maintaining of that law. It was a gift of God given to them. But now in Jesus, God's done something new. Now in Jesus, it says the word became flesh. And, and there we can stop on that very word. Logos is what that word is. Some people say logos. Some people say logos. I say logos because it's got two omicrons. Have you heard that Greek letter recently? And those have an ah sound. Logos. Logos is a rather complex Greek word. And the New Testament was written in Greek. That's why we're talking about a Greek word. But logos was a complicated Greek word. Um, and it doesn't just mean the written word on the page or the spoken word like I'm doing right now. Uh, if, if John wanted to communicate that, there are other words at his disposal. He used logos, which really means it's where we get logic. It means the reason or the rationale, kind of the, the argument for why God is doing things. But it also means a reckoning to take the parts and pieces and put them together in the whole and make sense of things. And so the word, the reason, and the rationale, and the reckoning of all that God was doing comes together in Jesus. And you can see that he, John points that out in verse 17. John says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Christ, Jesus Christ. The reason. As much as we can ever get a why, God's putting together a, a why in Jesus. He also talks about the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. When he says flesh, when John says flesh, he simply means human. That God somehow is in a human body in Jesus. And that's what flesh means. I contrast that because when we read someone like the Apostle Paul in, say, Romans, Paul uses that exact same word, flesh, but he is meaning, most of the time, the sinful nature of humans. And we know that Jesus didn't sin. So he's putting on the flesh, but he's not doing the sinful part. And in fact, there are two verses I want to flag for us that point this out. One is Hebrews 4.15, which says, For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And looking at the words of Paul in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What God did in Jesus is he gave his Son to fix the problem of sin. One of the enduring problems that we've already flagged that uh, New Testament scholar Gary Burge points out is that the world that the Lagos enters and that God loves is a place of remarkable unbelief. Both in the ancient world and today, 
So we have to reckon with the fact that we need a rescuer, that we are sinful, that we are in broken, broken relationship with our creator, the one we're designed to be in relationship with. And God is putting together the direction home in Jesus. One of the most fascinating things that I found in John chapter 1, and particularly comes to fruition in verse 14, is that it uses a lot of tabernacle imagery within the text. Um, so the tabernacle in the Old Testament, after the Exodus, the people are given the tabernacle, and that is the tent of meeting, basically, in the wilderness. It's the place where God is going to be visibly, as much as God can be with them, present in the midst of their encampment. So we can look at Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9, where God gives these instructions on building the tabernacle. He says this, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. So God says, I'm going to be there with you. You're going to see it in the tent of meeting. And what we can see, if we were to look at the camp uh, and as it's described in Exodus and then Leviticus, if we could be there, we would see that the tabernacle, God's visible presence there in the middle of the camp, and everything else is built around the tabernacle. We would see that the priests and Levites camp out in front of the tabernacle, and all the other 11 tribes then uh they camp in circles around, a couple concentric circles around the tabernacle. They order their very life around God's presence, physically doing so. All of life organized around God's presence, both in their camp and in following the law. And then consequently, as we discover in the law, when things were unclean within the camp, they had to be taken out of the camp to either be made pure or disposed of, depending on what they were. The camp was to be a holy place uh, around a holy God and everything pointing towards God's presence and living in right relationship with God as the center of camp. The meaning of this, there's multiple meanings, but one meaning we can take from this, if you ever to read Leviticus or the end of Exodus, second half of Exodus, you can see this. It's almost tediously in those books, God cares about the details of life. God cares about us so much. He cares about the details in our very lives. And one of the really important things to recognize that I think we sometimes miss about what they were living in the law and what we get in Jesus Christ is that there is freedom in God's order. You know, whenever I've gone into an elementary school, Blessings on those of you who work in elementary schools. It's a wonderful place of order amidst what would otherwise be chaos. There is so much structure and kids need that structure, don't they? They need that structure and in that structure they actually experience freedom because they know how to operate. They know what's right and wrong. And, and especially we can see with kids when they are given no boundaries they look free, but they're actually kind of terrified because they're not sure what they're supposed to do with themselves. They're not sure how to operate. They need that structure to have freedom. And God gives us that very thing in Jesus Christ, just as he gave in the law. And Jesus fulfilled the law. We have freedom in God's order. And in fact, when we think we have freedom outside of God's order, we actually have chaos is what we have. That's what false freedom is called. And so we can see God sent his son, uh, who the word, who made his dwelling among us. And we get that imagery of the camp. And we've seen his glory, John 1, 14 tells us. And you can see here, if we go to Exodus 40, we see the issue of glory come out. The dwelling and the glory. And they go together. It comes out. So Exodus 40, starting at verse 36, or 34, excuse me, it says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all Israelites 
during all their travels. Uh, this, where we see the cloud of the Lord, and also when Solomon builds his temple, the cloud comes into the temple and inhabits it, so much that the priests can't even stand up, let alone enter it, like Moses can't enter it. What we see is what's referred to as God's Shekinah glory. It's actually, the word Shekinah is not actually used in Scripture, but it gets used uh, within the same period of time and into the New Testament to reference God's glorious presence resting on his dwelling place and among the people. And, and so it's really interesting that, uh, that the word that gets used in the Greek in John 1.14 for dwelling, which means pitch a tent or, or encamp or take a president, sounds like Shekinah. So you have the, he made his dwelling, and we've seen his Shekinah, uh, Eskenosen, or Skene is tent in Greek. Shekinah sounds very similar to that, and, and scholars have made note of that. His dwelling and his glory go together. His glory dwells among the people, and we see that in Jesus. Whereas the law given in the Old Testament was a good thing, but it was simply a shadow of what was to come, here we have the real thing in the Word. The demonstration of, of what godliness actually is in the human person in Jesus Christ. The Word become flesh. It's, it's theory versus reality in so many ways. Just as we can theorize on what a good or a saintly person is like, if I ask you to think through, and maybe you can even comment on this if you want online, but if I ask you who's a saintly person in your life that has impacted your behavior positively, that's different than just saying, what does a saint look like when, when we picture the person? Then all of a sudden, there's reality. I want to emulate that person. The Word became flesh and made His camp with us. That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The implications of this that I want to point out uh, are a couple. And one of them I, I would just centralize around You could two questions. They kind of get at the same thing. One of them is, how is your life organized to reflect God's glory? You know, everything about the Israelite camp was aimed at the Shekinah, the glory of God among them. You could ask it this way, too. Is every action of your life geared to be a yes to Jesus dwelling among you? You know, a life centered around Jesus provides freedom. A life in Christ provides that freedom. So when we ask questions like, what's God's plan for my life? What does he want for me to do in this life? We actually begin to figure that out when we make Jesus our first love and center our life around him. The, the, the actual details of that aren't as important as the main answer to the question of if he's the center of all that we do. If he's the center of all that we do, then we could actually take an awful lot of paths that are God-honoring paths that are going to walk with him as the center, and we're going to be, we're going to be taking Jesus as the, the guide and the direction, just like the Israelites took the cloud and, and the fire as their guide, the Shekinah glory. If we're doing that, we're going to be walking within the will of God, and we can go all kinds of different directions potentially in life with career and friends and all kinds of things if we're God-honoring from our heart in the first place. And so to make Jesus your first love is to actually make sure that the camp, your life, is centered around Jesus Christ. You can see in this image how we need to make sure that Jesus isn't some kind of an add-on to our life. People easily do that quite often. But, you know, they, they would build their camp around themselves and church would be one component and this would be one component and Jesus would be one component and whatever it is. But Jesus actually needs to be the center point of the camp, the Shekinah glory of God right there. And we've put our hope in him, following him and his direction. Wherever he wants to move the camp, we go with him. And everything else is ordered around that. Our family, our friends, yes, church, our, our disciplines of reading and prayer and those sorts of things are ordered around what Jesus Christ is calling us to do and to be. And what you see is 
the word became flesh and he was full of grace and truth is how John 1.14 points out. That idea of grace and truth, sort of a package term, uh, means the constancy and reliability of God's character and salvation. So if we've made Jesus the center, we can rely on the fact that God's going to take us in the right direction because Jesus is the center of the camp and everything else is going to fall in place from there. If we make him one of the, one of the tents around ourselves, we're bound for failure and we are not living in freedom. And so the question becomes, how do we get there? Because God gave his sons to fix the, God gave his son to fix the problem of sin. He gives through that son an invitation to new life. And the question is, have we taken the invitation first and foremost? Have we said yes, not just to Jesus, but to making him the center of everything we do? And if we haven't done that, then that's our first step. If, if we've been at this business of church forever, but have never said yes to Jesus, or been kind of next to the story, but have never said yes to Jesus, now's the time to say yes to Jesus. But importantly, for those of us who've, who've made Jesus the center, and sometimes we feel like we still don't follow the direction terribly well, let me end by saying and bringing you into uh, an important discipline that we need to do regularly, which is confession. Because if the problem is sin and it's, it's our broken relationship with God, the problem is that we're not really listening sometimes to God because we have things that are unclean within the camp of our lives. And they need to be taken out. And so confession is at least a three-step process. You could add more steps, but I'm going to give you just three steps. I'm going to tell you what they are, and then I'm going to invite you to confession as our closing prayer. And that is, we admit that there's sin in the camp. The camp is unclean and not focused. We all have that. Every day we do things that dishonor the Lord, that sin against God. Every one of us, even if we've said yes to Jesus, we've done this every day and we need to make sure that the sin gets out of the camp because then we're not focused on the Shekinah glory of God in the center. We're focused on the sin that's in the camp. And so we admit, God, I'm sinful. I've done this and this and this. We, we need to be specific about those sins. From there, we acknowledge belief. We, and this is why things like the creeds and our, our reading of scripture and our gathering together are so important. We say, I believe. I believe in gathering with the people. Of course, we can't do that today. We understand that. But I believe in gathering with the people. I believe in your word and what it says and what it calls me to, even when it's hard. God, I believe. I believe in making you the center of the camp. And then thirdly, we invite Jesus in to renovate. Change the carpet, the wall colors, get rid of furniture and old papers and all kinds of things that we may be holding on to that are holding us back from making Jesus the center. That's confession. So that we can live in freedom with Christ as the center and the director of our lives. I want to invite us into a time of prayer where we get to confess. And I know you're at home. Things might be loud. Things might be chaotic. Maybe you have a situation that is nice and quiet. In either case, quiet your heart. Because no matter your environment, you can control and quiet your heart. And so let's go before the Lord in prayer. And let's take time to admit sin. Lord, we come before you. And we admit that the camp is unclean. And our hearts have turned. Take some silence to confess to the Lord audibly in your heart where you've sinned specifically and need redemption and forgiveness. Lord, we also acknowledge belief, not just what we've done that's wrong, but we acknowledge that which is good and that which is true and only found in you. Reaffirm in us the things we need to do to make sure that we don't allow sin to come back into the camp. Reaffirm in us the conviction of gathering together with your people, of gathering in groups, of reading your word, of praying. Lord, reaffirm in us those things that we need to do of times of solitude and silence before you, 
of fasting, of worship. Lord, we believe. Help us believe all the more. Help us reinforce those beliefs through our action. And finally, Lord, though it seems dangerous, it's actually life-giving, we invite you in to renovate. That which we've specifically confessed to you, we ask that you would take care of the problem of sin in us to forgive us, that what we need to do to make it right with you would be made right, and that we would cut ourselves off from doing anything offensive to you again like that. Renovate. Make us clean. Purify us. Make us holy as you are holy. I'm thankful we got to spend the time together. I'm also prayerful that this is just one of those anomalies throughout the year. Thanks for joining us this morning, for joining me this morning, and I look forward to gathering with you again soon. Amen.